Library. Um, my pleasure to welcome you all here for the Fall 2023 Graduate Series presentation, the first of two. This is collaboratively hosted between the University Libraries, Graduate Student Senate, and Faculty Senate. This series supports the research process of graduate students through the sharing of their successes, challenges, and their use of information resources in a public forum. The presenters for this series are selected by the Graduate Research Series Committee, composed of librarians and staff from the University Libraries, as well as the Graduate Student Senate. This morning, <laughs> Ada Lachey, Oriade Deep, or Oriade, a doctoral candidate in Media Arts and Studies from the Scripps College of Communication, will present Casting Black Cinema, Opinions of African Americans and African Immigrants on Contested Casting in Black History Films, which illuminates the multifaceted issues surrounding the casting of Black actors in Hollywood. Before pursuing his education at Ohio University, Adelage earned a Bachelor of Science degree Bachelor of Science degree in Mass Communication from Tai Shalawan University of Education in Nigeria, followed by a Master of Arts degree in Communication and Language Arts from the prestigious University of Ibadan, a public uni research university in Nigeria. Please help me in giving a warm welcome to Irish. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you. Uh, again, I'm Adela Jariade, and I'm from Nigeria, and I'm starting, I'm in my fourth year, transitioning to fifth year uh, doctoral program with Media Arts and Studies, and my committee chair is Professor Steve Howard, I don't know if most of you know him, he's retired now, but he's agreed to stay on to see to the end of this uh, wonderful exercise. So uh, I'm going to go straight into the presentation, and at the center of this presentation, I'm going to use myself as um, a pathway into discussing myself into this research as an African immigrant in code. So I come from so I come from Nigeria in West Africa. And uh, within Nigeria, there are like 250 ethnic groups. So I come from somewhere in the southwest, and we we are called Yorubans. So within Nigeria, my form of identity, the way I am known, is either I am Yoruba in my ethnic uh, identity or religious, Christian, or Muslim, or traditional worshiper within all of this context. So traveling, I've, I've been to a few African countries, but every time I stepped down from a plane in an African country, I do not notice a difference. I just assume into that identity because almost everyone looks like then in 2019, I took the flight from Lagos to JFK, and my reality changed. Stepping out of, out of the airport, I started noticing a difference. Out of every 10 people I met, eight or seven were looked different. At that point, at that conscious level, I started noticing I was different for the first time in my life. In over 30 years, over 30 years of my life, I started noticing some difference. It was at that subconscious point, Moving from JFK to Nigeria, from Nigeria to Columbus, in a very completely different environment, and everything just looked different. Then I came to OU, then I started feeling forced. I started went to the BMB, went to social security. Then I started no stressing. There was something about my identity that had changed. I had taken on a new identity called Black. So. In Nigeria, I was Yoruba, I was Christian. In America, automatically I assumed that identity blackness. So for every form I was about to feel, there was a space of saying, are you black or African-American, black slash African-American? And I had to tick, or not Caucasian, I had to tick somewhere within there. And as an immigrant, I use myself as an example to other black immigrants who come into racialized societies for the first time. They assume a new identity. And in that process of assuming an identity and looking back to the history of America and its marginalization of black people, their efforts to create diverse places, inclusion, and in that effort towards inclusion is created around the identity blackness. So we are trying to do some form of reparative justice for black people. 
And in that way, because I've assumed that identity, somehow I fall into that bracket almost automatically. Because anytime I take a form, I take blackness or African American. And that's the story of black British actors in their integration into American society. So for if you've seen any of these movies, Selma, Ariad, Get Out, Judas and the Black Messiah, you see that the lead actors for all of these roles, uh, Anyon Lowell for Martin Luther King, Cynthia Eribo for Ariad Tubman, uh, Daniel Kaluuya for a racially charged movie like Get Out that talks about the uh, interracial dating, the crisis of interracial dating. Then we have Daniel Kaluuya again for Judas and the Black Messiah. Then the question becomes, is blackness actually enough for these immigrants to play these characters? If it is a fight for representation, if it's a fight for diversity, we are trying to give back to people that have been marginalized within society, within the industry itself, within Hollywood itself. Is it's enough that they are black that they can play these roles? So we now start seeing uh, social media agitations about their place to play to play this role. So I've covered the identities of those people. So you see hashtags like not my area, boycott Comcast, not my freedom team. So African Americans are challenging their place, the place of black immigrants to play lead roles in these in these movies. And we can see that in these movies, it's not like the whole cast is black immigrants. The idea is just the lead actors. It is historical. Why should a black uh, British Nigerian play Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.? Why should Cynthia Rebo play such a character and all of that? So we start seeing people challenge all of this. We see example, uh, some of this is it. Kaluya lacks the American nuances of the character. Afro-British should not play ADOS historical icons. And ADOS means American descendants of slavery. So there are groups that are formed around those identities, ADOS, foundational Black American. And the idea behind this thing is to create a difference, to say that there is no homogeneity within Blackness. There's a difference around these identities. But there's a flip side too. And the flip side is for every historical African icon, for most of the historical African icons that have been depicted in Hollywood, it had cast African-American as lead characters. So you had Forrest Whitaker for Ugandan uh, Idi Amin. You have uh, Don Chidu for Hotel Rwanda. You have, uh, even for immigrant, uh, in, in, immigrants, we have uh, Will Smith playing Dr. Bennett Omalu, who discovered the science behind concussion and football and all of that. And we have Morgan Freeman playing Invictus. So it becomes a, a back and forth. If you argue that I can't play your historical role, why do you take on our own historical role? And it becomes a crisis. And when we delve into like literature theories and all about this, the underlying things behind the fanfare, the blockbuster, people watching it at home, there's the idea that when there is a disconnect between the audience and what you are trying to prove uh, as a form of representation for them, there's a need to dialogue with the audience. And there has been several instances of reception stories around black audiences, but it's been limited to African American audience, and it has never really touched on casting approaches because over time, Hollywood has tried to develop casting approaches that is more inclusive that is more representative and that, that really speaks to different identities. But black audiences have not been talked to about the idea of casting. What do you think about these casts that we do for these movies? And that's where my research comes into play, to bring that the voice of those audiences. And I felt what better group to do, these groups that are contending about these casting approaches. So, this is the tricky part about it. I came into the degree to study mass communication, I mean, media arts. And when I started this idea about films and I started thinking wide about it, I was limited within the framework of media studies to try and look at how do I 
do this. But as I delved deeper into this conversation, I discovered that it was too interdisciplinary to be limited to one framework. Then it took me to political science, it took me to media studies, it took me to film studies. In film studies, I was looking at theater and casting. I was looking at what representation meant within the, within the discussion of all of it. And I was looking at the latest, not the latest, at least the most popular approach that has been designed to try and correct the dark days of Hollywood casting, colorblind casting and non-traditional casting. And the idea behind it was that you can cast people strictly because of their talent and not look at the color of their skin. Then in that way, when we now drill down, we can now cast them. We can cast them because of their talent and not look at their ethnicity. So we've seen other scholars even try to look at it. We can cast them and not look at their sexuality. So there are studies out there by people who have studied why do you cast uh, non-LGBTQI uh, career actors in place of LGBTQI, for LGBTQI roles and all of that. So I started drilling down in that approach. Then and the, from their media studies, I was studying the political economy of the media, the idea that uh, the media at the top and there's a subordinate and how the media, how those behind the media make money based on all of these things and how profit determines every decision in the production phase. From the selection of actors to all of the how profit determines all of this. Then looking at media hegemony, casting for profit, then audience research. This is what I'm doing, reception studies. I'm looking at how the audience makes sense of what they watch and all of this. And then I was looking at stuff also encoding and decoding. The idea that the audience brings their lived realities into what whatever they watch. So African Americans are bringing their history into the idea that how can an immigrant act for them? And African immigrants are bringing their reality and saying that, nah, you can't be Mandela because you are not from Mandela's ethnicity or from his country. And that discourse. So I'm tapping into another pathway of black audience research. Then political science dealt really into the idea of race and the idea of race, the racialization of America and the pushback against race through ethnic ideas, how immigrants uh, socialize themselves into the country, how they exact their own identities against racialized uh, systems and all of that. Then I looked into black interrace relations because it was not possible to discuss this without looking at what had happened in the past between black groups that form the black population in America. African immigrants just represent a minute, a, 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 a minute part of that group. So it was impossible to look at that without immigration. Because the possibility of these contentions is built on the fact that both civil rights, voluntary black immigrants can come into America. I call them black pride now because they come from their country, but they assume blackness when they come here. And because we can come here voluntarily, unlike so it clears the delineation between the blacks who come for civil rights and the blacks who are forced here as slaves. So for my methodology to do this research, I embraced the qualitative research because it was like pioneer. It was like I was jumping into something really new, discussing all of that. And the first part of this was I did some form of paratextual analysis. And paratextual analysis means that you, dis you discuss issues around uh, a media text. So uh, reviews, social media analytics, and uh, social media uh, comments, posts, and all of that. And from that, I extracted about uh, 10,000 Twitter and YouTube comments concerning these contentions from, uh, from Twitter, from uh, using those hashtags, I was able to extract quite a number of data for analysis. And I did some form of paratextual analysis to give me like a framework about how, to, how best to go into the second phase of the research, which was the interview. So it was going to give me enough information about how to craft my questions how to reach African Americans and how to reach the African immigrant groups. So every participants that participated in the second half of the uh, of the research were purposely selected. So you must have seen like three of these movies. You must have seen three of these movies as I mean over 
over 18, sorry. And you must be over 18 and all of that. And I began collection of this data during, at the turn of COVID, after COVID. So I had some funding from uh, student affairs to travel to places to see, but people would not come into these meetings. So I'll travel to Texas and expecting eight people and two people will show up. So it, it became, so there was, there was a need for me to readjust my methodology to fit into that period. So I embraced online focused uh, group discussion. And because I wanted it to be in a place where people uh, lived their everyday realities, I went into social media sites that these discussions about diaspora talk, about uh, immigrant talks were uh, already existing. So I they used uh, Clubhouse. I don't know if anyone has heard about Clubhouse. It's an online. So that was where. So I went to black groups, African American groups, then immigrant groups, spoke to their leaders, and I saw. And I'm very happy that was the approach I took because. At the end, during the conversations, I had to stop it like three times before I could get to the right one because it was volatile. So I was bringing African Americans and African immigrants into the same room online, and every time we lost control of it. So I was, I can now imagine I would have been the person because this is a very tense topic about opportunities, about scarce and prestigious opportunities within the groups. That these groups are using. So, because it was a qualitative research, and like the uh, online post positive research and uh, quantitative research, there's no standard measure for uh, for ensuring validity, all of those things. So, that's where I come into place, my position. And these two images from Get Out, uh, I can't see, I don't know if you can see them well, show the my place within these two groups. So, if you look at this first image, it's Daniel Kaluuya looking with some suspicion. Like, and that was how African Americans looked at me every time I tried, especially the conservative ones who are members of foundational black American groups. And because they were challenging my place to do this research, who are you to talk about it? You represent the people we talk about and take our opportunities. Why should we open up to you? So those were the kind of things I needed to navigate. And the second part is, anyone seen Get Out here? You know the reaction Chris had when he saw another black person on the plantation, and that was African immigrant son. He was just so happy. He was, and he was, he was, he was a kind of problem to the research because I had to navigate the fact that I'm not here to come and justify what you said. I'm here to listen to you. And the idea is like I'll give an example. I was interviewing one, one of the immigrants, and he was like, "You know us now. The way we do, when we get here." When we go to class, we do. And they wanted me to affirm everything we said. So it was difficult navigating these two processes, at least for the African American side. Over time, I would have to go back, send my consent form, send my university profile, send everything to say that I am not doing this to try and get some information to use against you. This is actually backed by the university. I got a note from my professor to try and be assured and be assured. But for every time the African immigrants, it was just keeping my straight face, handling the conversation, making it feel normal. And because that, and it's a qualitative study, and I'm the most important research instrument that I'm having, and all of that. And it was, it's also very good to talk about my intentions for going into the research because it spreads like a diaspora war. And we've seen the idea that this can grow up into things if not mitigated over time. So my idea is to form some form, some form of way of looking at solutions, looking at these problems, delving into these problems, and finding some way to create uh, data that will be good enough to solve those problems. So in that instance, it's not as pan-Africanist as it used to be, the idea of Coalating all black groups into one jolly, fair, merry group. It's the idea of saying that there are differences. How do we walk around these differences? And how do we, and that's, and that's what I tried to bring out from this conversation. So I'll go to my findings. The first finding had to do with identity. And the idea was the, that there's a diverse conception of blackness. 
So African Americans argue that we are not one. How do you come and take that role? We are just different people. You cannot look at just our color of our skin and just take it. Our history shows we are different people. So the first position is that we own these roles. We, we own these roles and we should have the first right to cast for this role. So there were even examples of um, that one of the participants gave me about the idea that even for the movie uh, Queen and uh, Black and I forgot the Daniel Kaluuya, that the director actually did not even present the opportunities to African Americans. He just chose Daniel Kaluuya. And then Daniel Kaluuya chose, chose the person who performed with him unilaterally without opening it up for the possibilities of African Americans to participate. And the idea is that this role, they see this role as a form of restitution. The idea that we are fought, one literally said, we are fought for this for long, and all of a sudden we are not good enough for what we are fought on. So the idea is that the feel, there's a feeling of inadequacy. The idea that over the years we've, we've seen black representation that go back to uh, very racist representations like the Better of the Nation, uh, blackface, and all of that. All of a sudden, we are these prestigious rules and it's taken out of our hands. So we own it. It should be a form of restitution. This casting approach should be a form of restitution. And are we not just good enough? We play gangsters, we play all in these movies, and all of a sudden, there's Martin Luther King, who is really good. Then we can play. Then the second position that was very common within this research was the idea that there's a distortion in the history of African Americans. So if you watch Arabs, you know the character Big Along, and the idea that you create a movie around uh, Afri African Americans fighting for their rights, fighting to escape slavery, and the bad guys are African American. In a slavery charged movie, the black guy is the African American. And the idea is that there's a distortion and that casting assists with that distortion. So I really wouldn't, did not agree with that position, but that's the position. Because within this role, within these movies, the lead character might be an African Indian, but there are other African Americans in it. So the argument is that when you cast African Americans as lead characters, they come with some form of activist approach to the roles. They are looking, delving deeper and saying, is this actually true? Is this, can, is this story the true depiction? And the idea is that there's an attempt to make this history palatable in a way that it's easier to see. So one of the participants argued that, so you, you can go into, uh, argue that a white person can go into the cinema and come out and like, oh, so black people actually, when the black person is a black, is the bad guy in a black in a slavery movie. And Ariets had some form of uh, romantic relationship with a white slave owner. So in that way, it was they, they argue that there's a distortion to it and that this can only happen because African Americans are not really at the forefront of these movies and all of that. Then this was like the biggest thing, and it, it came across both groups that I spoke with, even with African immigrants and African uh, Americans. The idea that there's a commercial dimension to casting. So they don't believe that these historical movies are there's the cultural reasons for why we are telling those stories and are being lost to the idea of profit making. So the argument is that you watch the preview of a movie before the movie comes, you see the marketing, and the person who is talking, who is playing for them, Fred Hampton, is speaking to you in British English. And you're like, so how did he play this role? He creates this aura around black British actors, and this dates back not to even black actors alone, it dates back to even white actors crossing over from the United Kingdom, and the idea that they are better trained, they are better than American actors, and as part of the marketing, they allow them market those movies in their natural form. So they come and speak British movie, then they cut to the movie, and you see them speak genuine American accent, and you're like, oh, this is great, I want to see it. So it's like, there's a marketing around these identities in such a way that it is profit-driven. And this was also 
another part, uh, pattern that was noticed with African immigrants, they also argued in that direction. The idea that Morgan Freeman is good enough for Mandela is the fact that the producers are really not targeting the African, African market. They are spreading it around and they are looking for a popular place who can do it. And they are not investing in emerging actors. So you can't pick up emerging actors. Then the finding from the African immigrants and the first finding is like the most the most stunning. Probably I attributed it to some methodological flaw on my part in the, in the idea of trying to look at participants. And the first thing that came up was, I don't care, that is not my hero. So speaking to a Kenyan, speaking to a Ghanaian, speaking to a Nigerian, and the first thing they tell you is, Mandela, what's my business? It's not my business. So the idea that there's a unified African immigrant groups become very um, automatically challenged in that point. In the idea that even within, in America, Africans delineate according to nations. So as a Nigerian, I'm dealing with Sinobu running the country, the president running the country, the Naira falling in value. Why, what's my business with somebody playing Mandela if Mandela is not my hero? So, and that was why I termed it as some form of methodological flaw because immigration scholars have argued that when uh, black immigrants come into America, they always come and form pockets around nation states. So Nigerian immigrants, Kenyan immigrants, and in that way, and that was reflected in this finding. They really did not care. So to make for sense for this, I asked them about specifically their hero. So I'm like, as a Europe, as a Nigerian, if somebody came to play our law and they are from another country, how would you feel? And the idea was that no, I, you soon feel right for me. Are you saying they are not good enough actors in Nigeria? Are you saying they are not good enough actors in South Africa? Because we own this role. So when you say that we can't play, we feel inadequate. So in that point, they were pulling for nation specific. So as a suggestion for further research to look like when you now talk to them on their national level, are they going to refer back to ethnicity? Like I said in the first point, in Nigeria, there are quite a number of ethnic, ethnic groups. So now if you are going to go to Nigeria and pick an actor, is somebody from this ethnic group going to say, no, the hero belongs to my ethnic group? And that's for further research. So the same way uh, for African immigrants, they talked about nation-specific casting. So you should look for somebody from that country and cast them. And the second one is the interplay of accents and the homogenization in depicting African identities. So the argument is that it's, a, it's an argument of frustration. The idea that these guys just think Africa is one every day. And the idea is that it was built around assets. Have you seen concussion? Anyone seen concussion? So Will Smith did a very good job acting, but with a terrible accent. There's no accent like that that speaks to any Nigerian. And he was acting a, an Igbo man from Nigeria. When you hear the Igbo man speak and you play the video next to Will Smith, you see that there's a complete disconnect between these realities. So the idea is that if you pull an Af Am American out today from any crowd and tell them to depict, speak like an African, they are going to talk about one particular generic accent that we hear every time in one movies. And the idea is that if you don't cast people from these nations, you would not be able to amplify differences within African identities. And in that way, casting fosters a platform where you homogenize African identities in such a way that they are not different. So I tried to bring up a map of showing like, like different ethnic groups. And I, I'm saying like this represents like just 20% of the different realities within Africa. And the idea that this casting homogenizes these identities into one. And Africa might have to wait for so many years to start being referred to like England, Belgium, rather than saying that I'm going to Africa. Because this film industry continues to homogenize these identities in such a way that you are not amplifying the differences within Africa. Then this 
was a major finding, and it was the idea that African immigrants believe that they are more than white minorities. And I'll explain. And it's the idea that these actors were selected. So I ended every interview with asking about the opposite. I'm like, what do you think about African Americans complaining about this casting approach? And the African immigrants feel, oh, I just believe the actors are better because they chose them based on talent. So the idea is that we as immigrants go all out and work out for these opportunities and we are just better. And what this kind of idea does is it returns Hollywood back into that to the ages of stereotypes about the idea of saying that some identities are lazy, they are not putting themselves out for the roles, they are not good enough, and that's why these producers automatically select immigrants and all of that. So on the flip side, when I spoke to the African Americans and I told them, what, what do you think about, you've complained about immigrants taking your place. What do you think about Morgan Freeman, Don Chido, Forest Whitaker taking African roles? They're like, it's an American movie. <laughs> so they, they argue it's an American movie, so African Americans can take it. So what, does, what this does is that the argument from immigrants positioning themselves as model minorities who are doing good enough to take these roles. And the argument from African Americans arguing that it's an American movie creates profit for, for the white hegemony that controls these production companies. In the idea that African Americans are supporting media imperialism in Africa. And African immigrants are supporting stereotyping of African Americans. And who benefits from all of this? The media producers. At the further end. So you complain about something, but you support it subtly when it's done to another person from both groups. And in that way, that's it. So based on this, uh, I've come out with a few recommendations. And that's the diversification of the nature of black history movies. So at this point, from the two groups, the people I spoke to, they are tired of uh, one of them called it black trauma porn. The idea of seeing black bodies suffer, this history. So there's more to tell. I'm sure if somebody put a camera on me since 2019, it would make a blockbuster. Surviving, <laughs> surviving in America, that is a story, that's an immigrant story. And then the example of Bob at Abishola, who's seen that. Those are stories that go beyond the idea of tied to slavery, racism, supremacy. Once you diversify the stories, there are so many stories to be told. And African immigrants and African Americans are not fighting over scarce opportunities within these prestigious roles. Then culture sensitive casting. If there's a disconnect between those you want to represent and what they see of their representation, then it is failing. So there should be some form of culture sensitive casting, a way that drills down. I don't want to hear somebody speak like an Igbo man and I'm hearing a South African accent, a generic South African accent. So in that way, there should be cultural sensitive. And production companies, uh, production organizations need to categorize black history casting. Is it a form of restitution? Are you giving back to groups who have suffered marginalization? And in that way, if it's the form of restitution, you limit the casting to people who are members of those groups. But that is a moral argument. Because production companies are all about profit. So what is my argument to them? Are they willing to take that moral step in the idea of looking beyond profit when you don't see the actor you want, investing on emerging actors, and in that way? So, in that way, we are not fighting over black issue. In, in that and acting, then supporting up and coming actors. The idea that, oh, you talk, you say that I've chosen the best fit for this role, and the best fit is from another group. Why not invest? in an emerging actor from the group you are trying to represent, rather than cause the scales, because it, 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 it 
causes chaos between the black groups and to the benefit of production companies. Yeah, I cannot end this without talking about the library. Yeah, and this is like one important part. And I know some of my colleagues are here who never use the library. Try and use it. Uh, in my four years, I've used to... <laughs> they use the library from home. Try and use it here. Uh, in my four years, I've used the library in a crazy way. So I'll say crazy. My first year, I used to go to the silent rooms in, in the fourth, on the fourth floor. Uh, I felt the best way to approach American education and all of the problem was to keep silent and just do it. Then I realized that it needed the craziness of the bustle, the problems. Every professor is giving you an assignment like they are the only professors who's teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> no one cares about the other professor. So then I stepped from the fourth floor and moved to the seventh floor over here. So I think the ambience, the different sections, mm -hmm. I just go with the mood. Some days I want to see everybody coming from the coffee shop on the second floor, the bustle, and all of that. And some days I'm like, there's no progress. I have to go into somewhere very silent. And so I move around. People who know me will see me on the third floor at the last computer there. And sometimes I'm on the second floor. And that is where I've used the library. And I've gone to the seventh floor once. Once I didn't know what I was looking for. <laughs> Academia will drive you crazy and you, you will do things that have benefited from the interlibrary law, the subject librarian. Even before I got to this point of this research in my first year when I was not sure what to do, I, I disturbed Dante Araba. I think then I was still doing research around representations of LGBTQI characters and I disturbed her about finding literature for me within the African points. And, uh, and I just stopped Sherry at some point. So I was looking for a very, a concept that sounded like everybody has worked on it, cultural anxiety. Look, it sounds like something you just speak of and everything. And I could not just find any book. I've gotten books that had cultural anxiety as the, the title of the book. And there was nothing, no definition of it within the book. And it was like 300 pages. Wow. So I, yeah, <laughs> yeah I had cultural anxiety on it. And, and I, spoke to ChatGPT, and ChatGPT gave me a list of citations. Then I went to Cherry, Sherry and I gave it to her. And she went went back and forth. And she was coming back. I was like, I don't see the citations. I don't see the citations. Then I say that. Then she was like, wait, where did you get this? Yeah. Then I said ChatGPT, like, cool. These are fake. And that's when, I, <laughs> that's when I realized you don't rely on ChatGPT because of fake citations. And all of that. The live chat has been a lifesaver. Just going on library sites and like looking for materials within the library page, Google Scholar, and not finding it. And the person who I was chatting with just told me, I just pasted this in Google and I came up with it. And I've searched for like five hours on the library website and all that. So it was a lifesaver. The, the data analysis software on the second floor, on the computers in the second floor, that was where I did all of my data analysis. I, as I don't know if I can make suggestions to the library, the idea that now, especially for those of us in the media, arts, communication, most of real life communication at this point has moved to social media. And there's the need to embrace more softwares for extracting on social media because they are usually very expensive to, to get. I use Netflix, I use Leximansa. Leximansa takes like a hundred and something dollars to use. And, if those kind of things, those kind of softwares are provided for students, it makes life easier. And I know that I subscribed on the Samantha twice with two different emails. So when and you have 30 days free, so I try to do my analysis in 30 days. And I'm like, I'll charge you $145 and I go cancel it. Then I bring my Gmail register and do what I have to do. So if those social media analytics um, software can be brought to uh, Library to be good for students. Thank you. And that's
first of all, thank you for this presentation. Uh, you delivered it very well and very interesting. What about the whole or lack thereof of DEIA in the United States? Maybe potentially at some point making changes that could affect the film industry. DEIA, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And how it would. Can you please? Well, so in the United States, uh, especially it came about during COVID, uh, where there was a movement looking at different diversity within the United States or the lack thereof. And I'm just curious if this movement, uh, the way that you may see it, whether or not that has a chance of bringing more people into the films that typically are not, that are not in, in the films? Yeah, that is a very important question. Uh, and that was why I spoke to it in my recommendations on two grounds. First, in the recommendation is let's diversify the stories. Why not talk about uh, a Caribbean family in south of Chicago surviving within the bustles and all of this? And in that way, you bring new people into the movie industry. You represent them. Then the other position is diversity, inclusion, and all of this would not matter if the people you are representing don't feel you are representing them. So the idea is to bring these black voices and tell the production companies, the people regulating casting, casting directors, and say that the groups you are trying to represent feel a disconnect with the characters and feel a disconnect with the stories in this approach. So it's going to be a good movement, but right now the movement needs adjustment. The approach towards inclusion needs adjustment to read, to fit into the new realities of those that are included in this position. We've got two questions from online. I've got, well, first, first of all, a couple of comments. One person said insightful presentation. Yes. Another person said amazing. Yes. So uh, I've got uh, uh, Simeon Sunday uh, uh, asked, how does the accent of the actor affect the authenticity of the story and the actor's credibility of playing such roles? Yeah, so let's go back. I'm not making a position yet. I'm bringing the voices up. It's exploratory. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is, if you don't speak like me, how do you represent me? Mm -hmm. So it automatically challenges the authenticity. So if if I'm watching somebody and, and the person is playing a role of Dr. Beth uh, Omalu, the doctor, the if a Nigerian evil doctor, and I watch Will Smith all through, then somebody tells me that he's representing somebody from from my culture and I don't understand. I don't speak like that. My people don't speak like that. So the people who are being represented, the group who are being represented, feel left out. Every other person might not feel left out. Every American, all the Americans watching these movies or across Europe don't know how a Nigerian evil man will speak. But the group whose character is being presented know it and feel it disconnect from it. So for to ensure inclusion, you must be cultural sensitive in such a way that you represent even to little limits like the assets. Next question from online says, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, did you learn anything that surprised you? Yeah, that Africans are not united in America. <laughs> they, they refer back to their nation states rather than having an African identity, despite the fact that everybody sees them when they speak. So when we know, as an African immigrant, I know I've encountered the police in Chicago, I've encountered the police in Athens, and maybe I speak, they can know, they know that I'm not African American, they know I'm not Native American. And I think I get it, but I got a pass, my friend and I got a pass in Chicago, just because of our accent. So uh, they know, so, the idea that everyone sees us as African, but within the groups, within the African community, we don't see that we refer back to our nation-specific identities, even in the diaspora. So that was very surprising. I didn't see that coming. 
And I, I, I highlighted it as a methodological flaw and for more recommendations. I didn't have a question. So I'll just comment that like the, the um, accent thing I get because even like the movie Fargo, I live in Minnesota and I'm from North Dakota, like the accent in that movie is not correct. Right? And that even makes me crazy. So like I, I understand that. But I was my bigger question is like, how do you deal, I mean, I'm not an expert on the cinema or the movie industry, right? But it seems like a corrupt industry, right? So like how do you make integral changes that work towards a democracy and an institution that already seems corrupt? Yeah, and that's why I said my major recommendation is a moral argument. So we see this play out in affirmative actual uh, policies mm -hmm. in the past, in the idea that we are limited to just African Americans. But when you go into black colleges, you see Nigerians there taking up the space. So the argument becomes a moral argument. Are those in charge of this policy ready to adjust, to make it a form of restitution rather than diversity? So the idea is that it is driven by profit. The big six have a hand in all of these movies. There's no how you can, any of these movies that I've highlighted here, there's an appellation to the big six. They are just there in the background, funding it. And like the cliche says, you will taste the piper. It takes the tone. So the idea is that every casting decision is a profit position. Uh, the idea is, at least Hollywood pretends sometimes to do some form of real representation. Maybe as they pretend along the line to get the right score of true representation, but it's a moral argument. We can only make suggestions. Got another question from online, also dealing with representation. Uh, do you think racial classification of African Americans and Africans in the same category as Black slash African Americans plays a significant role in film representations. Yes, so that's, that's the problem here. The problem here is that the, uh, the identities in America are racialized, and the form of those racializations is the approach to casting for movies. So if, if I put a picture out to you and say, I want to cast for uh, Fred Hampton, for another movie and all of that, everyone who looks like Fred Hampton is going to show Everyone who looks black, like Fred Hampton, is not going to show until I say that I'm casting African American for Fred Hampton, and that will limit other people. So the idea right now is that black people are pushing back against the racialization of the idea, and the reason why they are pushing back against that racialization is the idea that there are no opportunities. So we want to hold on to opportunities that are that are preferable to just our ethnic groups rather have a generalized form of it. So, for example, the idea of thin and thick identities. So, and the advantage automatically falls to immigrants. In the idea that as a people to avoid the problems that come with racialization, with blackness, the idea of oh, uh, stereotypes, violence, and all of these things, Af African immigrants will say that I'm Nigerian American. But to take on opportunities, they will assume blackness. So they can, their identities are malleable. They can switch between blackness and nation specific identities depending on what benefits it brings. And that is taking away from African Americans because they must sit on that line and all of that. So, those, the way of conflating it into racial identities creates problems. Um, I know that you previously talked about collecting qualitative data, um, and I was curious about that because you were pulling comments from YouTube, using hashtags from Twitter, and I just want to know, did you collect any other data anywhere else using like our databases or our services like Statista or anything like that, no. or was it just the social platforms? Yeah, it was social platforms. Where I, I wanted to collect it from where these conversations were happening in real time to study real-time conversations okay. about them. So that was why I collected it on social media, YouTube. And I looked at a few reviews. I also took 
an interview from Al, Al Jazeera, took from everywhere just to see a, a generalized view. And every one I tried to analyze was coming from the position of the groups involved within the conversation. So I didn't take uh, that. Yeah. I do have a follow up. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm a researcher as well. So yeah. this is kind of like a silly question, but um, how did you organize all that data? Like, do you just have like folders and they're like, <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just curious. I have, I have folders, 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 folders. Then I merge, bring the data, merge, clean, merge, clean, merge, clean. So <laughs> that way, if I'm going to look for my source data now, it has newest S, newest X. Oh, so okay. the one with the longest S is the newest that I've worked with. <laughs> <laughs> so I count the S, newest, newest X, X, because I have to clean, merge, clean, merge before I import them into the software for analysis. So it's it's crazy in my own drive right now. So <laughs> I wouldn't wish it on anyone right now. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, if she asks for one more, one more question, or does he have a bit um, out of it that I want to be answered in terms of um, how the total number of respondents was sample size? Yeah. Okay. I spoke to eight African Americans, just it's a background study. I, it's like opening it up for, for that study. So I spoke to eight African Americans and seven African people spread across cities. It was then for the focus group discussion, I had like 24 hours, over two sessions. Uh, and it ran into too much data for one person to take care of. It's, it's what I signed up for. So it's, it's, like, it's like my my finding can now be moved to more quantitative studies. Mm -hmm. So you can now take from what I have gotten right now, and we can now amplify to quantitative studies and test on a larger sample size and see. Because one of the findings I got was people essentializing the role of acting. So the idea that, oh, because trauma has been passed through generation, and the actor, if you choose an actor from that group, that trauma helps them bring out that group. Mm -hmm. And that becomes very problematic because acting is just make believe. Be behaving like somebody you are not. Mm -hmm. So the moment you start actualizing it together, and that was when I talked about cultural anxiety and the pull towards essentialism. There's a need to test it on a larger population. Do people really believe in this? And if people really believe on that idea of biological essentialism, then it becomes a problem. Because those kind of ideas will lead to violent uh, ways to try and own up the opportunities. So. So if we want to be now asking them like specific groups, what is the key the whole presentation Yeah, and that's uh, the idea between restitution and diversity. The idea that, oh, it's make believe you can play it. But the idea that, so when I was doing the focus group discussion, so, uh, the person who challenged my face the most about being able to do this research is a state chapter chairman of foundational black america and his argument is, is is in his i think 47 year old and he said that my mom lived through segregation and she's still here this thing happened yesterday it is not time to open it to everybody it is still my role so the idea is that are we looking at that as, it, as a form of restitution and if the casting directors have said we've selected the best person who can do it are you saying that there's nobody within our group who can actually do it. So the, the idea right now is people still look at this uh, roles as a form of restitution because of the history behind the roles. So they would not look at the argument of whether or oh, the actor, they are seeing it as a, a very good opportunity. It's the biggest black movies. Usually they become the biggest black movies. So why give it out to everybody? So it's about economic opportunities as much as it is about whoever is playing it. So is this the right way to go about 
I would not be able to <laughs> That becomes a very tricky question for me to answer because I can't make those decisions. Uh, I came a bit late when you presented. So you spoke about positionality in your self being part of the data guarantee. And as an African, I believe there are some preconceived belief ideas about this topic. So how are you able to suspend some of your preconceived ideas? Yeah, it, it, it was it was tricky. It was tricky suspending preconceived ideas because even I struggle with the identity to African. So oftentimes I'm always on Twitter when I see a Nigerian say, as a black person, he asks me, it's like, you are not a black person. You're a Nigerian, you've never been on a plane, you've never even gone to a, a racialized society. How do you take on an identity that was created to create a distinction and an hierarchy in different places? So I think that first helped me because I struggled with the identity blackness in the first place. That is one of the things that first helped me. And the second thing was the idea of trying to disassociate. It is almost not possible for qualitative researchers because of our bias and, and all of that. So the best way to do it is to let my intentions know and begin to research so that you can judge the findings of my research based on my intentions and how I've integrated data and all of those things. So I wouldn't say I was able to completely disassociate, but I put in some efforts towards achieving that and by talking about my bias in my dissertation. It's like a long, a, over four pages of talking about how I tried to solve these problems. Like the first example of saying, talking to an African immigrant that wants me to confirm everything he said, and I'm just looking at them like trying to just disassociate in some way. So it's very tricky, but I did my best. Just a comment here, um, uh, Umaru, I'm probably butchering your name, sorry. Uh, it says, as long as you are transparent about your positionality, you are fine. So that was just a comment. There, so. I tried to be transparent. <laughs> No, I just wanted to say thank you. I really, really, really enjoyed this, but I also really, really enjoyed cinema. So this was just a very fascinating way of looking at this topic. And I have like a million questions that I want to deep go down the rabbit hole about. So just thank you for raising awareness about this kind of thing. I mean, there's so many like ways I could like keep talking to you about this further. It's very fascinating because I also I deal with theater and the same issues and other blind casting and so on. It's huge. All these issues are very huge about representation of, of people and how yeah. But thank you so much. It was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other is that a wrap? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for coming in. Thank you.